Hello world, this is CS50 Explained Week 4. My name is David Malin, and we're here with CS50's own Dan Armendariz. Hey everyone. Let's begin. All right. All right. So what do we have this week? This the start so of week this week was actually fortuitous timing world because a ending. nasty bug uh, called Shellshock was making the rounds of the tech news. Of and so we use this as an opportunity to really dive in fairly deep to current events and talk not just about what the bug is, but also how it works. Uh, shell shock or the bash door, but articles you have like milk and orange juice have not though been uncommon. Uncommon. Oh, that's an illusion of something exciting to come. Is it? It is. It's foreshadowing. Oh boy, I can't wait. Um, now, of those of you here today, how many of you have, even if you don't understand what it's all about, heard of shell shock? All right, and how many of you it's have... Like one person. <laughs> no, there are some more hands. hands. Okay, there there are some more far, hands. Far, far more but this was good, because it was germane, and the after the class, they could see. surely go start Googling around and find out more information as well. I'm sure they just Googled right now and <laughs> got all the information they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a few minutes to go into it in more than that. About to affect hundreds of millions of the world's web users. But what exactly is, this, what is, this is the clip bug from? that's been dubbed <laughs> This is a news clip. And what One of the few do? I could find that was discussing what shell shock is. Because I didn't well, want to just explain it. It'd be more fun to toss to a video and actually have someone who you know, added some interesting B roll or visuals. <laughs> 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 it's like the same B roll. I know, it's, it's like, like that guy generic talking. computer B roll. Hands typing, hands B roll is just being He's footage that's sort of visually. Potentially related. <laughs> Shellshock has nothing to do with networking cables, per se. <laughs> like, wow, that looks technical. Oh, red light, that's not good. Alarm. That's probably like the heat alarm or something. Oh, got a mouse. Well, worryingly, some analysts warn it could be a bigger threat because Shellshock allows complete control of an infected machine. Whereas Heartbleed, Heartbleed, of course, was another bug months back. It's so know, serious, it's been rated a 10 Well, not necessarily a lot of bugs, a lot of revelations of bugs. Mm -hmm. All right, consider how many we haven't known about, right? We still don't Two know about. Two-thirds of all web servers are at risk, including some Mac computers. I don't know what's going on with Amazon's website there. <laughs> make sure you patch your systems. Oh, boy, more now. cables. Anyone hosting a website running the fisheye operating systems the should take action. That server room. Well, that code had nothing to do with the, the bug. It should look to their monitoring some, and web application like that and just to look out for any arbitrary attacks. Every time server code. We can try to make CSP a little bit more interesting by just that, showing uh, people uh, would write server code that would <laughs> people typing and mousing. would infect all of these uh, computers. And once they do that, well, the worst thing they could do is just delete everything or shut the sites down. It's actually a nice, so we well structured video, like the way they punctuate it with the questions. I think it was just actually well done for a news report. By bringing systems down, for a news report? Files mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. things like that. For Some a news report. Some say this is one of the most difficult to measure bugs in years, and it may take weeks or even months. Well, I don't know why there's so much typing. It's ultimate impact. Oh, those hard drives. Oh man, typing and. All of that is true, Matrix but the funny thing is, almost all of the imagery you just saw, except for maybe characters. the keyboard, has nothing to do with the bug whatsoever. <laughs> um, servers and wires and so forth. Good point. Tangentially <laughs> related, but at the core, it's actually pretty familiar what's going on here. In fact, let me go into our CS50 appliance. Let me go ahead and maximize the terminal window here, and you guys have been using this, or the embedded version thereof, in G-Edit in order to write programs, type so commands, and so forth, and this more, is actually, um, and has been for weeks, Bash, revelations that have come out, or um, more born again shell, big errors that have kind of been revealed. Now there's, program there's a new one. I, I didn't prompt, effectively, that read too much on the technical boards, details, but it's called, like, I think it's called Logjam. Okay, so this just came and out with, and they somehow, they've determined that essentially a, a third party, I believe it's a third party, can request a downgrade in the encryption used between a server and a client to use 90s era but encryption no, technology. Instance, the reason that that's that bad moment, is because there were no export controls in the United hello. States so in the 90s that prevented secure encryption from being used worldwide because but if I want there to be the FBI and the, in I think it was the Clinton administration comp, actually wanted the ability to be able to easily crack it. Like yeah. And so the Not fact that this was easily crackable in the 90s means that it's essentially a joke encryption now, but many 
modern software packages still allow um, the server and the client, if, if they both agree to use it, to use that. And some of the servers are allowing this to happen. So. No, that's that's a different bug entirely. But this seems to be a downgrade attack that that's on the on um, the Diffie Hellman exchange between a client and a server that I believe a third party can actually inject. And this is this detail is, is where I'm a little hazy, but I believe a third party can actually request. Separately kind of, of those, fun. somehow um, attack the, the handshake such that the client and the server would little, use uh, one of those 90s era export, uh, export controls, encryption technologies, and therefore would not, uh, and therefore be able to read the encrypted uh, data a lot more readily. Uh, what well, you said earlier, hello. making 90s era encryption a joke, what is it that's changed since the 90s that makes 90s era encryption a joke? Well, not all of the not all of the encryption is necessarily a joke, but just that some of of the um, some of the encryption that methodologies uh, so that were allowed to be exported from the United States were intentionally crippled. They were intentionally made much easier to crack. Mm -hmm. And, and the with the power that we have, that have nowadays, now that it's been like you know, 15, 16 years of computing power, of the evolution of computing power since then, exactly, that it makes it much, much easier now than even just 15 years ago to be able to, having no knowledge about the keys necessarily that are being exchanged, be able to crack that encryption. It's kind of it's kind of worrying. It's it's interesting. It's an interesting bug, but I think that goes into Windows a lot more about, about this particular the, um, um, but those of you with Macs the aspects of how encryption like works and in in the particulars of Diffie-Hellman rather than this particular like bug, now, which is in the, in the shell, the word vulnerable, your computer um, is And this is such a nice to demo, too, and that they, they were able to come now up with a one-line, easy-to-type, relatively easy-to-type test to see if your shell is vulnerable to it. And sure enough, at this point in time, the CS50 appliance was vulnerable vulnerable to it because Ubuntu hadn't yet released a patch for Bash, mm -hmm. and, and so it was a few days after this came to light that you were actually able to update your appliance and Ubuntu more generally and uh, patch against this. Mm -hmm. It was a pain for us, too, because we have a number of back-end servers for CS50's so infrastructure that required some updates, and updating Bash is somewhat non-trivial. Bash is the equivalent of your blinking prompt, and it's your command processor, and so if you do something wrong there, you potentially put at risk your ability to control the machine, at least if you're using Bash, which tends to be the case. Uh, by default on a lot of systems, and it was but in our case. So I was very nervous, honestly, about right, updating certain systems of ours because um, when updating one thing, you can certainly potentially create some new problems. Mm -hmm. Now, the appliance itself so wasn't short, vulnerable per se because for the most part, students are using the appliance on their own computer on a private network because it's using NAT or network address translation or some other technique to essentially hide itself from the public internet. So the appliance can generally access the internet, but not the other way around. Mm -hmm. But it was still a good principle for students to run Update 50 right ultimately, which would pull in the latest updates for Ubuntu and actually patch against this issue as well. Bash has actually been reading beyond that semicolon and pretty much but I think this is a powerful it idea, and it, it's nice when this so kind of stuff happens during the semester because I just said um, even though the specifics echo might change term to term and year to year, malicious. just like being RM able to take some topic that they can inspect, go Google after, or, or maybe have even seen on CNN or Google News or the like, and distilling it into hopefully some familiar ideas and helping them parse something that looks cryptic. And honestly, even this looks like a mess to me. Um, but I at least really recognize like RM, RF, star. Like that feels bad. And I can kind of distinguish that it's in between or it's after the semicolon. And the semicolon demarcates the, the end of one command, for instance. So that helps me kind of parse that visually and understand it. And here, too, we hopefully send the message that so even if you don't understand the entire narrative of the story, idea. it's just a, with practice, can you start to pattern match on certain keywords or ideas or phrases so, so that frankly, you can infer from context what something's talking about, even if you can't quite grok the article, like 100%. And I think that's empowering. You were so to not everything looks completely foreign to you before long. stupid variable or function called x, but then tricking the computer into executing so this, beyond um, the boundaries this is of good. that function, beyond that semicolon, you I could like how you, uh, trick you know, the modified the example like to make it a little bit more clear about how this particular piece of command. code is kind Anything of risky. You can do with a computer, but at the same time, there's not a lot that makes this code any riskier than, since you already have access to the bash shell. If you are typing this into your blinking prompt, then you could automatically just type in rm-rf. Oh, absolutely. But this is this demonstration 
penetration is meant to be uh, an automated attack, essentially. And also to re and really to reveal that your system is vulnerable when it previously just said echo vulnerable. But, it's, but I think this also needs a little bit of a tie in to understand why this was truly dangerous. There, I think, needs to be a little bit of a tie in to like, the web server components and why a web server might actually do Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Do you actually? Shall we perhaps do that with the web example? That was not planned. How pedagogically sound was this? Oh, boom. A message that's a little more arcane. Any other feedback? No. Just call it a day. There you go. And this is nice because it's nice foreshadow of our discussion ultimately of web transfers. It came a little early in the term because we haven't talked really about TCPIP and headers, though problem set six actually dives into great detail on this with the web server assignment last year. But hopefully, uh, they'll take on faith that get and an HTTP or somewhat familiar ideas. The example.com um, is just a URL. The contents of a message that it received. At this point, how oh, far you know what? This is a bug. Trick a web server, therefore, I should have said host like user colon www.example.com. Mm -hmm. This is a browser, typo. User agent My bad. User Unrelated agent to the fundamental example, but I just noticed that now. This is just mm -hmm. your browser's way of identifying itself. But if a bad guy very cleverly says, mm, I'm not going to tell you what my browser is, I'm instead going to send you this cryptic looking thing with an rm rf star in it, you can literally trick a vulnerable web server on the internet into executing exactly that but at this point how um, all of the so they've had no Frankly, exposure yet to you can do anything you could start web servers or denial of service headers or the no, not yet. Um, how far away are they from seeing a few weeks so we're in week four, four so we don't get to this for several weeks later really once we've exited the world of safe do you come revisit these so topics short, or at least the shell shock topic when I didn't um not consciously it probably didn't didn't occur to me later in the term to circle back on it. Also, we move at such a quick clip toward the end of the semester no with the web stuff that I laptop. probably wouldn't have wanted to spend much time However, out anyway, but absolutely could have brought back up this slide and reminded folks now of the, the connection to it all. But environment variables are not something we spend much time at all on. They've come up in conversation a couple times, but it's not a particularly compelling topic to get too deep into. So for me, the takeaway Way here, or the goal uh, for me here was to at least communicate that somehow you can pass these kinds of commands into a web server and it will be tricked into executing the badness. Like the RMRF or whatever. Is that just like in the real world, the good guys are at the disadvantage. To keep the bad guys out, we have to make sure that every door is locked, that every window is secure, that every point of entry into a home is secure to keep the bad guys out. But what does the bad guy have to do to actually compromise your home and steal from you? He or she just has to find one unlocked door. One I mean, this was one of my biggest takeaways in focusing on security more generally in graduate school is just how stacked against the good guys the world of security is. And really, to, to perfect, defend yourself thoroughly, you have to patch every hole and have no bugs. And all the bad guy has to do is find just one of those to slip past. If you'd like to learn more about this, go to this URL here. There's no need for action tonight unless you're among those more. I try to give students the canonical references incidentally to things. So even though we might have pulled in a video or such, I'd rather the the title. Well, Reference. there they can find good really? point. Fair <laughs> point, fair <laughs> point, fair <laughs> point. Uh, for them to read some late breaking news on it and see <laughs> authoritative <laughs> links, uh, links to authoritative <laughs> sources. Essentially on this same topic. And mm -hmm. asking folks the question. <laughs> Not what I meant. <laughs> um, asking folks the question, should you really trust <laughs> ultimately the software you've been given. This is an For amazing instance, uh, turn award speech years ago that's now in paper form where you can read and to your on knowledge, about have you written any um, programs for CS50 these reflections where on there's trusting a trust and of the sorts. embedding in an exploit very subtly and very brilliantly your into your own compiler and it's a real oh, eye-opener. Right, and we are at the point in the semester even just a few weeks in where hopefully most students, if not all, can appreciate the trust that we've been assuming all this time. Like we've had them using make and clang not to mention an entire operating system and they're just assuming that whoever wrote week, Make or Clang be, isn't secretly be, injecting be, some like backdoor into their program or something, program. some but logic that they themselves didn't implement. That, um, um, but the even then, you're hoping that you gave them compiler. something. Why are we yeah, but even uh, we are, you know, trusting many, many, many people and many, many years of effort, and so who knows, frankly, what's what's inside there, especially if it rears its head only in very specific circumstances. 
access your computer. For instance, you can have your compiler your only add an exploit if you happen running. to compile your code right. at the right. strike sort of midnight on New Year's right Eve. Right. Where we trust right. that Clang is legit. You and that's kind of scary because you'll never notice it except at that moment. Unless you start trying to poke around the the compiled code. Even if it's not malicious, that's absolutely not. Even then, you may need to know the. So you should be scared. You may have to look at the compiler's code in order to really understand. Yeah, and what if they can throw away the? They can compile it and then throw away their code to the compiled. And what if the program you're using to look at the compiled code, like your text editor or your hex editor, is itself has an if condition that says if you open this file, don't show these lines? Yeah, it's frightening when you think about it. So that when we are writing and programs, then you even in a terminal window <laughs> like this, we can actually run ultimately graphical programs not unlike those. So here we're just giving a teaser of the so next problem set, which is our first graphical one since breakout. scratch. And the goal here really is just to get students game. kind of excited about what's on the horizon. We don't really talk in any detail about what's ahead. And indeed, one of the top. biggest takeaways so of this, this problem set sort of isn't so much to apply the algorithmic thinking of this past week, week three and now week four, and definitely not related to security, but really it's meant to be an opportunity to give them distribution code, really for the first time, a non-trivial number of lines of code that we have written uh, give them Stanford's portable library for graphics and have them appreciate its API and its documentation. Like we and we rather throw them into the deep end at this point, deliberately so, so that they're not just starting with an empty window writing a fairly simple program. They're writing a much more complex program, but really finishing a more complex program. Yeah, I am really just saying what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> How many lines of code approximately was the library for this the oh, the library is hundreds. Um, the distribution code we write in, May, in the um, breakout.c file, several dozen, not a hundred or more. Mm -hmm. And you expect them to go through most of the distribution code? Our code, absolutely. In fact, any, almost any time we have distribution code in the course, the narrative of the specification for the problem set walks students through the code. And I'll generally tell them uh, what functions to look at first and guide them through it so that they don't have to figure out how to wrap their minds around them. Uh, we'll often have some semi-rhetorical questions to which we do ask for answers, but we don't necessarily assess the answers to those questions because they're really meant to be forced thought exercises to make sure students have some milestones or sanity checks where, okay, got this, got that. And so that hopefully helps. Because most students have not read code before, and I think it would be unfair to say, here's some distribution code that we wrote, get at it. I think we do need to hold their hands through it. And that could either be in video form, in class form, in walkthrough form, or in just the narrative of the spec. Well, you definitely have them read code in lecture. Absolutely. But even smaller programs. I mean, Breakout is the first sizable program, because there's a lot going on there, not An to mention the question. sizable so library on which it's based. Mm -hmm. the code we wrote for PSET 3, for those familiar, it looks like it's Do a Do you have any distribution code oriented. where you Short have is it, it is. It's intentionally of how created a bug? That's no, I know you like this technique. But it is I like this technique only because it's sort of the no one aspect of, of programming see, that students really don't get a lot of exposure to, I think, which is the they, the they get a lot of exposure of, of reading now, code in the distribution uh, code. They get a lot of exposure uh, of writing their own yeah, code in snippets and within the larger right. distribution. But so and they have to debug their own code, but they never have to deal with the frustration that is very real. In fact, just happened to me in one of my own projects yesterday, where there's a bug in the library and I had to have the choice of either fixing the library or writing my code around that particular bug. Yeah, um, it's yeah. a good point and this too I think is one of these things we should do. Right? And part of it is that, that, really means or where that comes from. I need to but keep an eye out for interesting bugs that we encounter or that students write or that I write. So that we could turn squared. into N something interesting because I think if the bug's too obvious, easy, like know you know, if it's you know, you've been in two lines so but you haven't wrapped them in curly braces, so it's just a logical flow error. That's not that compelling. I mean, it's the really it's the subtle bugs that I think are compelling and hard to find, and that would make for a worthy challenge. But here too, I've also it'd be nice. But I mean, generally, we have hand, fairly liberal hand, policies around collaboration so that students can talk through problems space, so long as they ultimately write up the code on their own. Our humans, mm. But, but I, I, I guess part of me is also worried that if really there's just some easily spoilable like, key insight to some program, debugging program, that it's too easy for just word to spread what the issue is. 
Um, but I'm sure we could mitigate that by just having a complex enough solution or a series of bugs that somehow relate. And I think it's just my lack of own sort of confidence in crafting that that we haven't just yet. I have to think harder about it. So let's take a quick look, a little more methodically. It's true. What That's a good point. That it's we said it was n log n. a single. So if there was a single insight that, that would just spread that told us to do was uh, what? among the students rather than, than yeah, and reasonably, if they're just kind of talking through what the yeah. program divided does or how it works or what the symptom is, like it's hard not to reveal the so insight. The left yeah, I'm not and so worried about students sharing code because it's just a one-character fix. It's not a big deal per se. But sort it's hard to have a conversation with someone without the light bulb going off simultaneously for lots of people as soon as one person two. realizes How it. Do you sort a list now in so here's another pass at merge sort, which is where we sort. left off at this, um, the end of last week, whereby we used and humans last time, and now I'm trying to use just numbers alone to offer a different a list perspective and also a more controlled one, perspective like four here. about the human element. Mm -hmm. You're, it's sorted. You're done. But then how do you sort a list of size one when it's the number two? Well, same thing, but now what was the third and the key step in merge sort? You had to merge the left half and the right Ideally, half. I would have tossed on like one of the screens here, the pseudocode, but decided, I was trusting right, that students would remember first, the three so primary two steps. Place, sort left half, sort right four. half, merge. And mm -hmm. now you have to kind of rewind. The base this case. is sort of characteristic of an algorithm like merge sort. Rewind in memory. What was the next line of the story? I forget. What should I be so you showed pseudocode for merge sort? The right half of the left half, which is six and eight. And did it actually include some recursion? So let me just step through this without recursion? belaboring the point too much. Six and eight, and six. And six. No, it, it did implicitly because the three key lines were sort left half, sort right half, merge two halves. And so sort left half and sort right half were essentially recursive calls to any sorting algorithm, which presumably would just be merge sort. So as such, yes, recursion. So is that the first time they saw recursion? Yeah, I believe so. And in fact, after we're going to dive back into it in a little more detail and use a more a simpler example, just involving summation of numbers, for instance, but implementing that non-iteratively and recursively instead. Then two, then three, then four, then it's five, then six, then interesting. There wasn't six, big fanfare seven, about it. Then eight. Uh, so now why is this old? Well, 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 it's today. I mean, we're going to do a silly Google example too for Google recursion. Oh, okay. But I try, I mean, this is actually an oft asked question as to, you know, why don't we do more recursion in CS50? And part of it is perhaps on me for just, you know, we just don't. Three. We d deliberately don't spend uh, much time. It's been a conscious that, choice not to focus too much on problems three. that lend so themselves to recursion. We have so many other things that we merging. tackle instead. And, we and in the past, a few years ago, we really shoehorned it into the class rows. where we sort of hmm. forced students to do a couple Total exercises end, right? involving recursion. And I just found it less and less compelling because a very reasonable reaction was like, who cares? Like, why would I do this? And in fact, in the past, I made the mistake of implementing many examples of recursion when you should not use recursion to implement them when you so can use uh, iteration instead. And now um, just like Fibonacci sequence is an off-sided one and mm -hmm. now um, any number of other sort of canonical examples, but out of context, well, it's like who cares? Like you can do this much more efficiently without the, the overhead of recursion. And so then we would sort of talk about, well, what's happening on the stack? And you have well, all of these functions sort of piling up in the recursive calls if they're not tail recursive and optimized out by the compiler. And we just, you really go down this rabbit hole and just for what purpose? Like recursion is much more compelling, I think, in the context of the high level algorithms here, absolutely. And that's all when we do get to trees, See, and it makes, it's just so simple to traverse a tree recursively, it makes good sense there. The running time so we don't force it nearly as much anymore. Be on the and in fact, the follow-on course on campus, CS51, spends great time and attention to the topic. And so I'm not convinced that we need to dwell on it either. Beyond exposure to the idea so that students might see it after CS50, even if they don't take another class. So if the running time in general, we just say is t of n. Seems like you'd and have to. And now you're kind of punting here. In order for it to be really useful, you'd have to have some sort of a data structure that is fee-based or what? What's the size of the input? Something, something like that. But and over two. so you don't really have any. That. And then this is we used to. We had a Huffman coding assignment, which is a compression algorithm a while back. And we jettisoned that partly because it's just kind of a nasty thing to implement in C, at least with passing all of these pointers around and pointers to pointers, which we don't really spend time on these days. So it was a correct and like a clean implementation, but also unduly complex. And so now we we've not done it since. So open to suggestions. I think we just would need to have the right topics to make sense to spend more time on this. So we might express this as this, and this is where now we'll punt to the back of our high school math textbook where that's recurrence 
ultimately ends up equaling this. N and this is fine, I think, for CS50. Like, I wouldn't want to get into the weeds so with the mathematics One of the recursion with a and actually um, example using eight proving, numbers. for instance, that it does work out to be n log n, that kind there. of expression. But what's really <laughs> I think it's fair to stipulate for now. notion of cycling is I'm not using for loops, I'm kind of defining something in terms of itself, not only with this mathematical and this function, is a nice mathematical, though, in incarnation of, of recursion, code. so you can kind of see it, especially for the more math inclined students, you can really appreciate, like, oh, I see why that's recursive to mathematically. Go use itself to solve a smaller problem of smaller size, and then again and again and again until we whittle it down to this so-called base case. So let's actually draw a more compelling takeaway from this as follows. Let me go into, uh, G-Edit and take a look at some of today's source code. So here's the example, example that I was alluding to sigma earlier, zero, where which apparently first I just want to do some iteration, and I want to have a function so that I'll call sigma, like unfamiliar. the Greek letter, first we have a couple of which includes, generally represents so the summation there. of some series prototype. of values. I'm a little hazy on this after a few days, but what did we say a prototype of a function just is? Just a little C recap here. It's been a few days that, now since we actually looked at actual We announced code. it, so you were teaching, playing, hey, not actually implementing this yet, but somewhere in this file, presumably, is going to be a function called what? Sigma, and this is just a promise that it's going to look like this. It's going to take an integer as input, and, this was and a I can be more explicit here. and say I, int so n, yeah, and it's going to return <laughs> an int. But semicolon so means it's mm, correct in C to just specify the type Again, of dumb. a parameter it's only in a prototype, bottom, so we need to but I've generally adopted the style of repeating the main variable main names as well, here, just for consistency. Mm -hmm. is doing. It's not that long of a function. So that really is a copy and paste of the definition of the function. I declare a variable n, and then I pester the user again and again. So this is for a code and a structure, a logical int, structure we've used and only and exit before. Out of this loop once the user has complied. Do and this is really just the, the driver routine, like now the main function whose sole purpose in life is to call I sigma. To we just need a bit of effort to get there sigma. so that we have a value like n. Yet, but I remember and then I actually it a print out the answer. So the juicy part here is going to be to reveal how is sigma implemented. And then I report the answer. Well, let's scroll back for just a moment. Let's go ahead into this directory. Make sigma zero. So now we're just going to prove that this works by a couple this of examples. And see what prove happens. that it works. So if I go ahead and run this program, I say prove, of course, because unless we try all zero, possible values, it's not necessarily correct unless we prove like it somehow <laughs> inductively. Sigma, as the Greek symbol implies, it's just going to add up all the numbers from zero on up to two. So zero plus one plus two. So this should hopefully give me three. <laughs> that that's was, all that's the doing. extent and of my skill. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that seemed three, right. That's three plus two, so that's five plus uh, one should give me keep six. Keep it simple. Yep. And then Good. if I get really crazy and start typing in bigger numbers, it should give Don't me Don't know the answer to that. Yep. So that's all. So what does sigma look like? So by like? now, you would think I would. So it's pretty straightforward. It's how we might have implemented this for the past couple of weeks. Int is going to be the return type. Sigma is the name, and it takes a variable m instead of n. I'll change that up top. Then this is just a sanity And that's deliberate. I generally choose, even though I want to call this n here too, I don't want to accidentally send the message that the variable you're passing into a function, which in this case was n, has to match the parameter definition in line 39 here. The declaration of the parameter, rather. And then return the sum. So a couple of questions. One, I claim in my comment that this relatively straightforward. You have some. You know, Why would busy work to do the sanity check to make sure m is not negative. And then you have a fairly clean for loop that just iterates over all of the values that hopefully students m, should be comfortable with at this point. In, so but it's kind of ugly. You know, it's not if super ugly, but it's you know, a bunch of lines of code. And what's nice now is that the follow-on to this is going to be to implement this recursively really just to demonstrate the sure elegance with which you can sometimes implement an algorithm. So if m is negative, something like negative 1, I mean, this is one of these happen? subjective well, things that we're trying to teach by one, example, like this and then I clean code, is correct going code, it's not particularly elegant. There's no beauty to, to it, as recursion often lends itself to. No. Stand by. Confused look. Something going that on. That was, let's not, let's nix this story. I didn't ask that question because the risk that I am alluding to is not going to happen because I is always going to be uh, ah, greater yeah. than, okay, I retract that question. Okay. Let's focus only on what this part here. Question? Why? So I'm only Why looping in the end so long as i is less than or equal to m. Mm -hmm. So if m is a negative value, that loop will never execute, and sum will remain yeah. zero, and mm -hmm. zero will be returned. 
Mm-hmm. So the if condition up front sure. is strictly necessary. Sure. So first and foremost, logically. I certainly yeah. don't want yeah. to yeah. that and then initialize some to zero within the logic inside of, my of the loop on every iteration. So on the one hand, it's good that I have it those lines 41 through 45 because it's all the more clear zero. what's going on. And I'm protecting myself against myself, especially if the lower implementation changes at some point. But I'm also paying yeah. an unnecessary penalty of checking that condition every exactly. time the function is called, even though the check is going to be implicit later on. So I'm a little conflicted here. Pedagogically, I like the explicit check. But well, the reality is, it's ago, not the best design, uh, so really it's not really strictly curly necessary. That yeah. I'd probably so check it. Yeah. Yeah. Inside of these outer curly braces, I can't use it in line 53. Yeah, Put another way, you if do I want to in here or even within the for loop, I could not. It can. I can see that being a source of confusion for students, though, where so they can imagine there, that. Oh, they can. Go back and see what so there gets are there are cases, but not every case is covered by. Right. And then returns the value, stores not, it in answer, and print that here is why. But I think that would be the thought exercise: implement that same function without those topmost lines, without the if condition, and then ask. Is there any again, way that this might again. devolve into an but infinite loop? Kind of suppose the input is zero. Suppose the input is one. Suppose it's I negative one. Suppose it's 50, things. negative 50. Try to choose some this? representative corner cases. Well, probably the other way to, to, be to do it would be to change cool. the for loop really that get rid of um, a lot of distraction this goes, goes really that starts, that initializes some value i at m and decrements m while m is greater than zero. This and in that way, you have an example of a loop that's actually... Alternative yeah, but I don't like about that, though, is that generally if I'm passing in a value so like m that represents the input, I wouldn't want to mutate the original input. Right, but m I think that... Do a copy of it. I would, I would show no that source code before, before this last one that you just had and, and then talk about the reasons why. So because that, that there's multiple bad things. Um, the there's multiple bad reasons why you would not want to do this. this one of them is that you have to do the check now to make sure that M is positive. Oh, I see where you're going with this. And you want to induce a bug. Right. I see. You Intentionally induce the bug and then okay. show how that, that style could, or that design okay. could be improved. I don't, so it's just a small design yeah, I don't dislike that. discussion that sort of uh, came about accidentally here. This, this is the beauty that I was alluding to, the fact that, especially once we get rid of some of the syntax, you can really distill sigma so into just four just lines like, um, of code. In a sort of, if you're just trying to annoy a friend and they ask that you a question, you kind of respond with a That is perfectly consistent with the mathematical kind of definition of it, too. But what's key is that if you keep making the question smaller I think and smaller and smaller, statement. you're not asking what sigma of n, what that, sigma of n. That was four also, right? If you're asking what sigma of n, no, no, if you, in the iterative case. Um, um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah we still declare the, the counter, one. though, outside. So, okay, it's not so much the lines of code. <laughs> I would, But it's the simplicity zero, of the code. So right. a very small value, and as soon as you get that, your friend... You are not going to so that we need an arbitrary cutoff so say, that oh, we don't zero. Rec- We're done um, playing this sort of stupid recurse game. infinitely, or at least so until some overflow condition. Is the mm-hmm. of a function calling itself. This but here, too, this is where I like this exactly idea. It demonstrates way, how we might implement the same function recursively, function but you should not implement sigma recursively like this, right? unless you're going to trust your compiler to do the optimization of the tail recursive call there. I first mm-hmm. compiled this, so make sigma. And that's an interesting tension, I think, with some environments and some languages where the elegant solution, like the well designed version, is one you shouldn't use because you have some out of band knowledge as to how that's actually going to work underneath the hood. And we haven't gotten to this conversation yet in the class, but if you keep calling function after function after function, you're going to have all of these frames piling up on the stack, all of which take memory and some amount of time. And you can only do that so many times before you run out of your allowed memory space. But like I shouldn't have to care about that algorithmically, uh, and that's now it. the tension we've introduced, I think, mm-hmm. and, then and why I want to kind of get out of this without in, getting, um, enter, without it seeming, uh, without creating, uh, doing more bad than good. How many of you are willing to fess up to seeing that? Okay. Well, tail so calls this can happen to be for a number of reasons, sort of and frankly, this is more of them. But in this case, algorithm, recursive algorithm. What uh, might tail call recursive, here. and you know that your language supports this. Something that we don't go over in 50, but I think happened. that tension is but resolved a bit with all of the, 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 the went discussion in C64 about that. For those unfamiliar, tail recursive call just means when the last line of your code is essentially the recursive call. So a smart compiler can realize that if the last thing you're doing is calling yourself, calling yourself, calling yourself, well, it doesn't need to keep piling these frames up because ah, if it's the last line of code, so the it doesn't need the, the previous state anymore. So and it can just it keep staying at the, the same level. 
possible in the memory space. Good idea, but not cause a crash. That might cause I think even a good tail, the bits just flip tail call over language and uh, will take it a step a really further. Any, like a number, it doesn't even have to be a, won't cause a crash, recursive call. It could be any other function as well. But there, I mean, keep in mind, we're in week four of the class. I'm not sure I want to get into compiler optimizations at this point. But I think the context here again and again uh, the and again and recursive, again and again, and none you know, of those functions calls, ever finish. finish yeah. because they're this so is a good example in CS50's hacker, uh, or rather more comfortable again. sections and that really tends to correlate with the students who do the hacker editions of problem sets. I think this would be a juicy no topic to really dive in deep there with one of the more comfortable TFs in one of those sections and talk about these kinds of nuances. And I think that would actually pique curiosity quite a bit. And scratch an itch among those who are looking to not just reinforce knowledge they already have, but really dive into some juicy material that they've never seen or picked up on their own. And here's the here's a picture that I've adopted over the years. It's obviously super simple, but it paints hopefully a well-defined and fairly simple view of the world. Um, and this is just kind of a religious debate as to whether the stack grows up or down among certain computer scientists. I deliberately do it the way that in reality you would stack things on top of each other like trays in the cafeteria, mostly so that we can use trays that metaphor. Wow. Cue perfect timing. Wow. Great. We had to sneak those out of the dining hall, which is uh, just across the, uh, the, calling another the hallway That's behind like the theater the here. So I only have Need a little three? more memory. Yeah, we Give me that, that. <laughs> and then it gets piled on on top. It's kind of hard when your your lecture is about to start. You run into the dining hall. You're not supposed to take the dining hall trays from the tra dining hall, and you have to convince someone credibly that. Just the things in the class, here. I swear to God, there's all the <laughs> students there. It's so it's always a little awkward. We should really just get our own trays, and perhaps. If doing mm -hmm. this, eventually, kind of map this visual. <laughs> it really would be a nicer stack if there were more really of them. Be, yeah. <laughs> it looks like one tray. He is going to exceed the amount of memory your computer has. And as soon as this green tray I, Hopefully it's not too much of a stretch for a student to imagine putting more trays onto this pile there. Heap, which will no, I think... Um, that is a bad I, thing. I was thinking a little bit more about this diagram and how there's... Pile and pile on, you're going to I, I think there's your there, own there may be a source of confusion about this going to crash. sort now, of as awkward aside, black space recursion, the stack of the heap. Okay. That how, how do you know? So it looks as though this is kind of predefined, how, right? You have a predefined amount of size. That, but it is. is right, right, two gig space or whatever. But do... And we're not going to use recursion Do all students that much in CS50, understand that in CS51, from the and really diagram? Class where you well, what I've like probably stipulated verbally is that this is your computer's memory super space. Super so if you have two gigs of RAM, this is the now two gigs aside, of RAM. So and so, in short, yes, this is all of your computer's Google's memory. And we're simply Google modeling Google, it as this rectangular region. Up, we're chopping it up into different chunks. And we just don't have a well-defined cap on how big the stack or the heap can be, other than they can't cross each other. As an aside, I pulled up a few. This was like... Ten minutes of procrastination this so morning. So this is cute. If, if you've you never also seen Google it. askew, <laughs> this is uh, academically irrelevant, but <laughs> it's ever like so slightly skewed. Slightly. Which you can't quite see because we've sort of keystone the whole frame. Evolved, but it's crooked. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Implementing this some years ago. This one's just ridiculous that someone at Google spent time doing this. Oh wait. Oh, and you, apparently you have to really uh, type it explicitly. Right. So how much JavaScript code is in Google.com? So just for that stupid example. So running on one of the biggest <laughs> websites are these stupid little Easter eggs. He oh thinks they're gosh, stupid too. Yes, that's wow, amazing. we really think just alike. <laughs> just so that we can have little fun things how like that. How many Easter eggs do you have in CS50? You get some exactly. of those inside jokes. Uh, so now let's uh, take yeah. a Relatively look. few. For a while, we had the Konami code buried in some the courses website. So that if you hit up, I don't think so. If you hit up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A on your keyboard, something would happen. I don't remember what would happen. That have now Does started to roll? become on the forefront no, of everyone's mm, attention. Maybe. In the media. This is so very famous code from Nintendo where you can get a lot of, what was it, three lives? Name is swap. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA. Or get to jump got around. around. Nothing. You got it some benefit from the game, some so sort of cheat code. That's all I remember from well my childhood. Because you would also have the JavaScripts for the falling snowflakes in the winter. We do. We, around the holidays, we actually, on... Fun, fun fact on Halloween, which often <laughs> falls during the fact. day of the week, it's never a fun so fact. Laura, it's, it's usually a fact, fact though. It's usually a fa fact. It's his thing. On Halloween here, which right. is October so 31st in the some, U.S., we uh, tend to um, put a little Easter egg. It's not even an Easter egg. It's pretty, it's pretty explicit. <laughs> where we choose the loudest, scariest witch's crackle and embed it invisibly in the website, so that when you visit cs50.harvard.edu, all of a sudden you hear like. <laughs> 
students hate that. It's so loud because invariably and understandably students are in other classes <laughs> and you know maybe they're getting a little distracted and so they pull up CS50's website to check some piece and then their speakers are on and all of a sudden everyone knows they visited a Halloween themed website. So that's our contribution to campus culture once a year. <laughs> So here you busted out again with the uh, wireless fidelity. Glasses. No, this is the Google Glass, uh, which uh, have fallen out of vogue now, but is it's been a nice way for us to put them on a student's eyes and actually look out at his or her classmates so that we have some footage of his or her perspective. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing here with our brave volunteer is uh, demonstrating how you might swap the value of two variables, trying to make clear yeah. that you need some temporary storage space if you it's want to, not to make a mess of the orange juice and, and the milk here. Step three. Yeah, save All the right. tricks. Excellent, you know, a big like, round of applause. If, if you have Laura. two integers, you can, there's some sort All of right. summation well, trick that you can do. Oh, you can, yeah. correct, yeah. summation or real, like XOR case. is a nice incarnation Thank of this. Thank you so much. Right. So, so this was meant to just demonstrate though, how we swap two values because mm -hmm. now what we want to do in this class is introduce a bit of debugging techniques. The code's getting sophisticated enough, pro the problem set involving breakout has enough distribution so code that we want students to be able to walk through it potentially. So, so we, we want to introduce GDB, which tends to be the here, which is the tool that we use in CS50. And the example with which we motivate this is a very simple implementation of swap, which seems to be correct logically, but it doesn't work. And what we use this for is to one, today, demonstrate how you swap, which we just did with the OJ and milk, but two, how to debug a program or at least understand why this is broken, but three, also as a sort of cliffhanger to motivate our soon-to-be discussion of memory management and pointers to explain why passing by value, in fact, does not allow you to swap two values permanently. You're going to have to pass by reference or by address instead. So there's a lot of opportunities with this simple swap function. I actually have really liked so this, this as the vehicle via which we touch upon a number of topics. I have the prototype for swap up there, which means its implementation is probably down below. And let's see what this main program so probably is going to do for me. Circling into I first declare well. very soon, yeah. very soon. Not it's momentarily one, here. Here we're just going to trip over the OJ problem and try to understand it with GDB. And then before long, we'll get to the underlying reasons. So I can visually see what's going on. And most of this program, most of the main function here certainly is just sort of starter code that demonstrates the bug where you'd like it to say x is 1, y is 2, and x is 2, y is 1, but it's not going to say that. But yet, upon further look with GDB, you'll see that A and B are getting swapped somehow correctly, just like the OJ and milk, but it's not taking permanent effect for some reason. This has always been a challenge here, so soon I'll take out GDB myself. This is one of those lessons where no matter how much time we try to spend on GDB, whether in lecture or in section or in pointing students at it in a problem set or pointing them at a short in which we demonstrate it even in more detail, this is one of those things where we, it's hard for this message to sink in because there's such a learning curve. GDB is not a very visual tool. There's a couple of graphical front ends to it, but none of which are super straightforward for students, none of which have the ease of use of something like uh, Gedit itself, um, or even some IDEs that do support an embedded debugger like Eclipse or NetBeans or the like. And so it's always been a challenge for the students and the staff, I think, to be convinced that this is a good use of your time. You might, you might have a bug, and it might take you an hour or two to now find it instead of 10 or 20 minutes because you now you have to learn GDB and you have to double check what that command is and you have to understand what GDB's output is saying. So there's absolutely this annoying learning curve to this and tools like it, but it so pays off in the end. And students only realize probably too late, many of them at the end of the semester, like now you're spending one to two hours trying to chase down a bug that with GDB, ironically, would have only taken you 10 or 20 minutes or even one or two minutes. Printf does not cut it as a debugging technique. Inside of the second top <laughs> Though I think that tray, students find it that swapping has no good impact. enough. And based yeah, on just some yeah. basic principle we talked about. But this is one of those things you gotta just ago, take our word for it. And the more students you do, it has a long term savings. Of swap mm -hmm. Even no though it comes at a short term cost of additional time. Even though I passed X and Y to the swap function. What's the key word here that might simplistically explain? And it's been tough. That too, I would say, is. Uh, uh, I think you hear it here? 
uh, side effect of that reality return, means that we as a staff aren't always okay, so good return, at teaching students these techniques, right? Because if many story, of our teaching fellows and course assistants themselves were for past students, many of them, so uh, particularly the stronger ones, did take us at our word and did dive into GDB and get comfortable Maine, with it right and use it themselves, but there's certainly a subset of the staff who themselves never got comfortable with it, and so they haven't been communicating that message to students as strongly as they might, and so that too was a difficult challenge about, I think, the support structure we have in place where we bootstrap ourselves with our own former students. Um, certainly not a deal breaker, but it's something to keep in mind. So let's take a look at this. If this has been so difficult, level. have you considered using just one of the GUI based ones? I can imagine the students would just have a much easier time. Um, a debugging, maybe. Uh, right. Terminal debugging. window. Yes, but it's a very heavy-handed like solution, I think. Suppose like every year or so, I take a look at the space of IDEs for C specifically, so which like we're a world now in which I we want to stay. But I think NetBeans and Eclipse and even code blocks, um, which are probably the three biggest ones on point that would be cross-platform and particularly Linux-friendly, they're just too bulky. Like They're slow, they're complex, there's so many more menu options and icons and text that there's so many distractions in them, whereas in GEdit's interface, pretty much everything you see is a feature you would use because we've deliberately customized it in the appliances preferences like so that you only have enabled the features we want you to have, at least by default, so I'm do this. Instead of and nothing more. And pedagogically, I think that's important. There's so many new things for GDB students. The command line is one of the most daunting. To so now have in this words, massive environment like that we simply ask them, oh, don't don't use 90% of it. Like, I don't think that's ideal. I'd much rather they use 100% of it or 90% of it and feel like they're and remove they're really mastering so something. If I run here, yeah, arguably, though, the, the same thing is happening with GDB, where there are from the so many features of it that they're not being introduced to. Some, but I mean, we have the biggies. Just, the the just because it's hiding it's behind a text interface yet. rather than a button doesn't necessarily run. mean that it's, it's the first that we but it's different for there being sort of secret commands you don't know about versus there being menu options and buttons that are continually in front of you and you don't know what they do like this, and if you hit them you don't know what you just did I think though that um, I, I want to push back a little bit just on that feeling of mastery that they have because I think the more custom that this is for them the more they realize that if they do master it they are just mastering that custom element of it and not necessarily Line yeah, but it's customized only insofar as it's simplified. It's not like is. this is uh, a tool this that we developed specifically for CSFD. It's still just a text editor. Function. We've just enabled the so features that we would run. like them to Notice be cool to have here. at their disposal by default. Mm -hmm. But I would say the bigger kicker too with most IDEs, if not all of the ones I mentioned, is that so I don't they all tend to have metadata associated with projects or a dot project file or a dot workspace directory. And so there's this layer of indirection between the file system and the student's actual code. And I always hated this, especially early on. Like if a student creates a PSET1 directory, the only thing I want in it initially is like Mario.c and Greedy.c and any other files we have them create. I don't want a whole lot of distractions and metadata that some tool has put there. And that's been a challenge too, is it hasn't let us maintain Maintain the simplicity of the file system we want in most cases. This is interesting yet, because but it's about to be. when so a indeed, student's code, when, it, when a student's printf, program seg faults, doesn't it create a core dump file? And that, and that, that, that I'm okay with. So, for sure. But that seems yet. to be at so odds with that. The or comments you just made that you don't want there to be. No, but that's a side effect enter. of an action now they took, whereas my concern seven. with a so lot of the IDE, IDEs and their and utilization of the file system is that they just make the whole thing much more complex than it needs and to now be. This mm. is Admittedly confusing. Dollar sign two is just a fancy way of if you want to refer. To I do hear what you're saying, and I wish like there were a nice silver bullet. But I would say of all of the right tools we've tried over the years, this combination of GEdit with an embedded terminal window, I think, has I been the most. Two, I mean, it's essentially a simple IDE, again, which is exactly what we want. It does admittedly lack the debugger. That is by far the biggest weakness. But otherwise, it does almost everything. And in fact. You know, for a long time, I've actually wanted uh, autocomplete or contextual menus that a lot of the again, IDEs have, so that when you start typing GDB PRI for printf, it shows you a little drop down menu of all of the symbols that match that printf or variables that also start with those three characters. And yet, more recently, I've had mixed feelings about that, because much like I've had concerns about check 50 becoming too much of a crutch for students, whereby they use that instead of an actual compiler to see if their code compiles, I do worry that if we're just continuing 
continually prompting the students with autocomplete that the so um, syntax of the language and the vocabulary of C and, and then PHP and then JavaScript will never really sink in to the same extent. So I have mixed feelings. And middle ground might be to enable autocomplete early on in the course, but then try to remove that training wheel. But the reality is even in the real world, like having autocomplete even for the most sophisticated of programmers is just a handy thing. Yeah, I mean, so I, it's, next, I, type step, I definitely find it that I will, it has I forget the, no I, I happen to remember the elements if of the language and the keywords of the language that I'm using most often, and then the, the others, I know that they kind of exist, but I don't remember swap, exactly what the name is. is. Argument lists would be helpful to know. Yeah, and a quick Google search usually does that. So essentially, and I imagine that's how many students work as well, is that in asking some or something yeah, like that's Google. Fair, fair. Or the man page, as we encourage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It hasn't been initialized. And so mixed feelings there, but the because, program, and I'm contradicting myself too, because one of the reasons I love system, using PHP, my admin so in the class, even though UI has been getting worse and worse and buggier and buggier over the years, is that it has these drop down menus of like all of the various data types you can choose for your column types. And it has little check boxes for whether you want something, check boxes to be if you want to auto increment or a lot. So it sort of pedagogically walks you through the various schema argument, design decisions you have like to make, was the first thing being but tested. admittedly the price so we pay is that a student so certainly won't be able to type out the create table command. One. Frankly, I'm not sure so I would remember all of the syntax perfectly because I usually do it with a tool. Is a um, tutorial so it's a trade-off, and so that's what I would worry about. So not opposed, but if we could add a debugger, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm not too, I personally am not too worried about that because I think that if students were to work with it more, then they will just by default start learning that um, the syntax and the words and keywords that they need to use. So with, with SQL now, for example, like sure, you might not remember how to by looking at explicitly create a, a create table sequence or a create table uh, statement, science, but you'd be able to find it very easily. I agree. I might be being a little too day. pessimistic as to um, the, hey, the results of using it's autocomplete. Pointer yeah. fun. So this very video is terribly what? short. It's what a <laughs> few second teaser from oh, our friend hey. Nick Parlanti at Stanford, who invented That's the on Wednesday. We'll see which will flesh out in more detail in the lecture. And now, deep thought by Davin says. Why are we learning C? Why not A plus? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> See you soon.